you go. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship, those of you in the sanctuary and in the transept room, and those of you joining us at home, we're glad that you're here. And at the end of the pews, you'll find a stack of uh, communication cards, and if you would sign one of those for us, we would certainly appreciate that. The offering plates are in the back of the sanctuary or here in the front on the pedestal, and at any time you can put your offering or your communication card uh, in there. It's great to have Maria and Nick back with us. We were just talking about when the last time they were here, and we think it was early May. And I said, so were we in the book of Acts then? And the answer is, yes, we were. And now some of you at this moment, when you heard the word book of Acts, you went, oh, there's a... See, it's funny that you want to make it a quiz, Doug, because, <laughs> because I said test. And what's the difference between a quiz and a test? I don't know. We'll figure it out. At the end, we can vote whether it's a quiz or a test, but we're glad that you're here. Let's pray together, and we'll begin to worship the Lord. Almighty and loving God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you that you are here with us. I pray for each person here, whether this is the place that they come every Sunday morning or today for the first time or maybe the first in, in a while, I pray that you would meet, meet us all here that you would assure us of your love and your presence, your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. We pray in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> this is a reading from Psalm 147, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if you would please stand and join us in song. Your 
Almighty God, your goodness chases after us, and your mercy never fails. And so we trust that as we come forward and speak to you of the places in our life that aren't beautiful, that harbor mistakes, that go against your will, we have the confidence that your love extends to each and every one of us, that your goodness runs after us to draw us back into the Spirit's tether. God, forgive our wrong. Give us new hearts. And send us out into the world, extending the grace to others that we have been given. We pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Christ, we are forgiven, and that brings us peace. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with those nearby, saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Ember, you coming? Charlotte? Colby? So I missed some of you guys last week where I was going to read from the step-by-step -step Bible, 
and you guys weren't here, and so I decided that I'm going to read it to you because we didn't read it last week. Is that okay? Awesome. So it says, Paul was put on a ship and sent to Italy. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? It's like a cruise in the Mediterranean. Okay. As the ship sailed, it began to get into rough weather. At a place called Fair Havens, the ship stopped a while. Most ships would not sail that late into the year. Paul warned the ship's officers, if we go on, we will likely have a shipwreck. The captain of the ship did not agree, so they lifted anchor and set sail, keeping close to shore. A fierce wind began to blow the ship away from the shore into the open sea. Finally, the crew threw everything they could overboard to keep from sinking, but the storm raged for 14 days. Can you imagine being in a storm for 14 days? Till at last the ship ran aground on the island of Malta. Everyone made it to the shore safely. The people of Malta were kind to the shipwrecked men. They built a fire on the beach to warm them. But as Paul was lifting some firewood, a poisonous snake bit him. Did you know this part? It's there in the Bible. The people were sure he would die, and when he didn't, they decided that he must be a god. Do you think that's right? No, I don't think so either. The governor's father was sick. Paul prayed for him and healed him, and many other sick people came, and Paul healed them. At last, another ship. Why did they need another ship? Because the first one was all crashed up. At last, another ship came to get them. And because Paul had helped them so much, the people of Malta gave them all they needed for the trip. In Rome, which is in Italy, Paul was permitted to rent a house and live in it. And a soldier guarded him at all times. Three days after he arrived, Paul had a meeting with the local Jewish leaders. And he, sorry, he told all, them all what had happened. We want to listen to you, they said. People are talking about Christians everywhere. So a meeting was called, and Paul talked about Jesus. Some believed in Jesus. Others would not. Paul criticized the Jews who rejected Jesus. You don't want to understand, he said, but the Gentiles are accepting Jesus. And for the next two years, Paul lived in his rented house. No one stopped him from telling visitors about Jesus. And during this time, he wrote letters to believers. Some of these letters became books of our New Testament, like Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. The Bible does not tell us what happened next, but many people think the Emperor Nero set Paul free. He may have made another missionary journey. And then he was sent to Rome again, this time not to a rented house, but to a prison. At that time, most of his friends deserted him. A tradition says that Paul's head was cut off, probably in A.D. 67 or 68. But toward the end of his life, Paul wrote triumphantly, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Let's pray. God, thank you for what might seem like an abrupt end to the book of Acts this person that we have read about and that we have studied and that um, we admire, um, his life, we're told, comes to an end. But we thank you for his witness, and we thank you for his fortitude and his strength. And we pray that we also, at the end of our lives, would know that we have run the course and that we have finished the race. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may return to your seats until I call you back, okay? You have a special job to do a little later on. Awesome. Please. Deb Foreman has a moment for ministry for us. Good morning. Good morning. Church World Service helped start Crop Hunger Walks in 1969. And here's my advertisement. Woo! These are community-led interfaith events to raise funds to end hunger, both locally and around the world. There's over 500 communities that are walking, and not all on the same day. And we walk so that people that lack access to clean water 
might have better access to water. In underdeveloped countries, uh, women, an average woman might walk 3.4 miles to obtain water for cooking or for drinking. So guess how many miles the crop walk is going to be? 3.4 miles. This is on September 24th. It starts at 2 o'clock, and it's the same day that all those crazy motorcycles come to town. So if you're looking for something else to do, maybe <laughs> going to Mount Vernon is a good thing for you. It starts at the Christian Church, and it winds through downtown, um, and it's to bring awareness while raising funds. 75% of the funds provided help provide water and food especially to refugees, but 25% stays in our own community to help Skagit um, County. One nice thing that we are doing is collecting small toiletries. There's a, there's a box outside of Ann's office, like this, and inside are toiletries. And what we're going to do is have the high school kids help put them together in little packets. And these will go to the Friendship House in Mount Vernon. Families, strollers, and dogs on leash are welcome on this day. You can register online to give, or you can make a donation to WPC Anacortes. <coughs> the, funds, the funds raised will help provide water, uh, water systems, food, tools for families to grow food, and also livestock, which helps develop um, economically some stability for some of those um, poor folks. So the website is crophungerwalk.org, and then you click on Skagit, and then it'll say, scroll down, it'll say WPC Anacortes. So, so far there are four people on my team, and you might see another shirt in the audience. Stand up, honey. <laughs> Yay. And we would love to have more people join us. Um, I know that they've done crop walks in the past, and it's a great way to meet other people that really have a common um, goal of raising money to stop hunger. So if you have any questions, I will be present after the service and would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deb. This morning, we are welcoming new members. And so with those elders who are prepared to do introductions to come forward, and why doesn't the Schaefer family and Bev Bowen, why don't you guys come forward? And um, Val, why don't you start us off? Super happy to. Bev Bowen, come on down. <laughs> it, exactly, exactly. Um, and actually, I'd like to, oh, oh, I'm going to wait for the Schaefers to come down too. Schaefer family, come on down. Woo! Just, uh, yeah, you two, you two could win. Um, what a great celebration. Um, I just have to throw out there, Bev, I have actually known Bev. Bev was one of the first people I met when, when I came to Anacortes. So it's really, a, a, it's a privilege to have had you for a friend for so long. And we have a history, and it's a very positive one. Um, I know, you know, we have a history. Anyway, um, and, and I just have to throw this out. So Bev's birth name, her main name, Beerlink. Hey, can anyone guess? Where do you think Bev grew up? It's a, it's a town north of us. Her last name is Beerlink. That's a Linden girl. That's a <laughs> Linden girl. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh oh, my camera, my my thing. Bev lived, grew up in Linden. She left for college when she was 17. Dort, of course, um, lived in Lahaina for over a year and loves to travel. You're getting ready to go on a big trip, right? A couple weeks. She was married for 24 years to T Terry Bowen um, before his death in 2009. Uh, she has two beautiful kids and one beautiful stepdaughter. She recently retired not only from teaching, principaling, right? You have been a principal before. Were you an assistant principal too? Nope principal and teacher um, from the Anacortes, LeConnor, and Oak Harbor School Districts. She enjoys swimming, hiking, water skiing. Yes, I am impressed. Um, 
She was really active in another church in town for 30 years. She's involved in music in various ways, and it's been such a joy to do music with Bev. And she feels welcome and exci- welcome at, S- at WPC and excited to be here. So that's our lovely Bev. Good morning. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce the Schaefer family, Nancy, Dennis, Austin. Um, They met, Nancy and Dennis met in Kansas, and um, they were, Nancy was raised in the Presbyterian Church, and she and Dennis married. They were both active in the church and served as elders and deacons. They are both retired, Nancy from the Anacorta School District as a speech Speech pathologist. (laughs) That was not intentional. (laughs) And Dennis as a project manager from IBM. Austin is, according to the family, the spiritual, most spiritual person in their family. And he reads scripture and uh, prays on a daily basis. He's a big fan of musical theater, fine dining, and travel. He especially enjoys finding old bookstores, and if I recall correctly, you have quite a selection of Bibles, and uh, he works in the mailroom at Island Health. Nancy is also a quilter. We have quite a few of you out there. And Dennis enjoys uh, boating, as well as woodworking and gardening. How'd I do? Okay, we welcome you. So um, both Val and Dee welcomed you, and we want to extend a warm welcome to you. Um, One of the things that we do is introduce you and try to give the congregation a little bit about you. So like all the other Kansas people, where are the Kansas people? Yeah. So you are not alone as Kansas people, uh, far from, from where you grew up, and make connections. And Bev, you know people on the music team, but we try to 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 make those connections so that people can welcome you and you can feel connected and welcomed by others. We talked at our good morning breakfast about um, what what needs to happen in order to be a member. And um, members in the Presbyterian Church, you've been baptized and you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So we just like to give them a test, one test that, you know, we aren't taking at the same time. Um, But this is the question we told you then. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you trust him? Do you intend to be his disciple and show his love? If so, say, I do. And will you be faithful members of this congregation, giving of yourselves in service, and will you seek the fellowship of Christ's church wherever you may be? If so, say, I will. Okay, now you guys get a test. Okay, do we, the members of this congregation, welcome Bev and Nancy and Dennis and Austin into this church family and promise by our vows to strengthen their ties with the household of God? If so, smile real big. It reduces stress. I learned that in Sunday school today. And say, we do. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for calling us to be a community of believers. We thank you especially for our new friends who stand with us today. Give them strength to honor you in their homes and to love and serve your people. Give us strength to reach out and properly and equally welcome them into our fellowship. We praise and thank you for all your faithful children and ask you to bless this body in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear ones, God has made you members of the household of God to share with us in the ministry. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Austin. Welcome, Dennis. You may be seated. Old Testament reading for this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. 
he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. He, a bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will and Carrie, can you uh, skip over the scripture slides and just take us to the PowerPoint, the map? Um, we're finishing the book of Acts today, and we have been looking at the book of Acts since May 7th. Um, and so we're finishing looking at this map. Um, last week, at the end of chapter 27, Paul and his friends were shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And you can see from there the, the red line that goes all the way up to Italy. And I'm going to say that the children's Bible today presented the scripture. And so I'm not going to take the time to read all of chapter 28 to today. Um, but I told you that we were going to have a test. And so Elaine and uh, Alex, this is the time for you guys to get to the aisles, being ready to move those microphones around. And our young people, let's see, Charlotte and Colby and Ember, uh, there are baskets on the front pew that you will need to be holding and then traveling. Go, 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 go. Oh, you already got your microphones. Who's doing this aisle? Alex, which aisle are you doing? That one, I guess? Okay, come on. And find a section of pews. Charlotte, why don't you take this section of pews? Okay, see, never mind. Hang on. Charlotte. Why don't you take that section of pews all the way to the far right, okay? And if somebody gets a question right, what do you think you're supposed to do? Here. You give them a piece of candy. Do you allow them to choose? Yes. No. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. Exactly. So let's take a, our next test, or our next slide is going to help us with some scripture for this morning, um, some scriptures that will guide us where we're told, um, where we, we say to God, uh, test me and know my thoughts, and God says, yep, I got you covered this morning, and then uh, we cry out and we say, oh Lord, we beseech you, give us success, and so that is our prayer this morning. Here's what I want you to know. If you've not been with us, that's okay. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you've been with us and you know the answer to every question and you raise your hand every time, lovely. Guess what? I'm not going to call on you every time. Uh, for those of you who are prone to blurting, I confess, um, try to zip the blurter, okay, um, so that people can do their thinking. Uh, we have one question that is specifically for people under the age of 10. So especially don't blurt that. Maybe we'll raise that, I don't know, to 15. Um, we'll take a look there. And then the other thing that I want to say is that there are all kinds of questions in here. There's some true false questions. There's some multiple choice questions. There's some, you know, essay, short essay answer where you just get to explain your thinking a little bit. 
And I will tell you that at the end, our last question, or maybe our second to last question is, is there something you learned in this sermon series that I didn't ask about? And like, say whatever you want. You get candy, right? Um, So, are you ready? I think I gave all the preliminaries. Um, So, zip the blurter. Raise your hand. You do not have to be a member here. You don't have, anybody? Who wrote the book of Acts? Okay, I saw Forey right there. Tell us, Forey. Paul. Oh, I'm going to ask that question again. It's about Paul. Luke, should we give it to him? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, question number two. Points and more points. What's the name of Paul's hometown? And can you remember, for an extra piece of candy, the region that he's from? Anybody? Anybody willing to do the first part? Okay, who do you see? Who do you see? I see a hand right back there. I see Silver. Tarsus. He's from Tarsus. Do you want to phone a friend and see if anybody knows what region he's from? Begins with the letter C. What do you think, Crystal? Not Caesarea, but remember that word later. (laughs) Cilicia. So give this young woman some candy. Okay, our next question involves a map. And so Antioch is 290 miles to the north of Jerusalem. So why does Luke say Paul went up to Jerusalem From Antioch. I saw Gail's hand first. Alex? Because Jerusalem is way up high in elevation. It's an elevation question. Excellent. Make sure Miss Gail Biscoche will get some candy. (laughs) Uh, True or false? Now, zip it. Raise your hand. Paul was a Roman citizen. Let's see. I see Christy right here. True. Excellent. (laughs) Give Christy some candy. Okay, this is one where you're going to have to make your case, okay? Some people call this book the the Acts of the Apostles, and others call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Which do you prefer and why? why? So so it's open. How do you want to answer that? JoLynn, I see your hand. Alex, she's right next to you. Um, I think it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit guided Paul where he was going and sometimes didn't allow him to go places he wanted. Okay, thank you. Give this woman some candy. (laughs) You know, if you clap for each person, we might not get through all the questions. Okay, this is a question about geography and how well you can quote the Bible. What was Jesus' geographical promise to the gathered disciples before his ascension? What did he say to them that was a geographical promise? I see a hand in the back. Valerie, what did he say? Ends of the earth? Yep, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right on. Give her some candy. (laughs) Okay, back to true, false. And everybody should be raising their hand for true, false, because here's the beautiful thing. If you don't get it right the first time, when I give you a second chance, (laughs) you're going to get candy, okay? True or false, Paul was a Pharisee. Okay, Doug Davidson. True or false? True. True. Charlotte, you want to get, oh, Ember, Mr. Davidson, some candy. Awesome. Okay. For those of you who like to wear your church name tag um, because you know that you're not great with names and you wish other people would wear their church name tag, this is about the name of a person. What was the name of Paul's first traveling companion? I see Bruce Fairbanks' hand behind you, Alex. Uh, Timothy went with him. I don't think he was his first. Deb Foreman. Barnabas? That's right. Awesome. Hey, Bruce. Don't, don't, don't. (laughs) (laughs) 
so, so don't, go, don't go with Timothy, okay? But do you know the name of Paul's second traveling companion? No. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to phone a friend? Who do you think might know Paul's second traveling companion? Who do you think? You think Crystal might know? He's, putting you, he's, he's pointing to you, Crystal. You got an answer? Charlotte? Excellent. Why don't you give Crystal and Bruce some candy? <laughs> Charlotte? Okay, now we have a visual. And you don't have to know the book of Acts to know this answer, but in some of the slideshows that we did, um, we saw a lot of this kind of artwork. What is the name for this kind of religious artwork? Okay, I see Jean Congdon right next to you, Alex. You guys got to keep your... An icon? Can't. It's an icon. Excellent. Thank you, Ember. Let's turn the page. Uh, geography question, name of a town. In what town were disciples of Jesus first called Christians? What was the name of the town? Jeannie? Corinth is a part of the series, but not the right answer for this question. Would you like to phone, phone a friend? Would you like to phone a friend? Would you like to phone Elizabeth Davidson, or Dennison, who has her hand up? Tell us. Antioch. Antioch. Why don't you give candy to Jeannie and to Elizabeth? She picked a great friend. Okay, so this goes back to the teens chapter in the book of Acts. When Paul would go to a new town, we notice that he would stop in one particular place first. D. Fairbanks, I saw your hand first. Where did he stop? He stopped at the synagogue. Is that what everybody else who had their hand up was going to say? Excellent. Make sure you check in with the kids for candy at the end of the service. This is super generous. This is grace candy today. Okay, here is a question where you need to put on your thinking cap and do your best to explain. Explain why Luke's use of the phrase, the Jews, shouldn't be interpreted to mean all Jews and therefore understood as an anti-Semitic term. I, I put it to you that he wasn't trying to uh, be anti-Semitic. And who is that in the very back? Tessa, I see your hand. Stand up and give it to us, sister. Um, he was talking about Jews that were opposing the Christians, and most of the Christians still consider themselves part of the Jews in general. So, Excellent. Right on. Give her some candy. Okay. Digging for details. Explain why this question is of no small consequence. Daria. Because it's of big consequence. <laughs> because it is a big consequence. We talked about how Luke, when he's narrating something and he wants to emphasize it, he first sort of diminishes it and says it's not a small thing, it's a big thing. He does that four times in the book of Acts. Excellent. It's now time for a commercial break <laughs> from our sponsors. Next Sunday, the 17th of September, our executive presbyter, the Reverend Laura Terasaki, will be visiting our congregation. She'll be preaching, and she and I will co-preside at the communion table. I'm not sure, but it can feel a little bit like if you're a teacher, and it's that time when the principal comes and sits in. So come to church next week, <laughs> smile a lot, sing loudly, gaze adoringly, and we'll all look good, okay? next Sunday. Okay, for those of you holding candy baskets, and if you're under the age of 15, here's a question for you. Before Paul became a believer in Jesus, he went by a different name. What was that name? Ember. It was Saul. Why don't you pick a piece of candy? Close your eyes, because you can't, ah, uh, see, see, uh-huh. 
Excellent. Why don't you give it to Miss Deb to hold it for you? Hopefully she won't eat it. Are you ready for some multiple choice questions? Yes. Okay. In Lystra, in chapter 14, the unbelieving Jews, thank you, Tessa, uh, had a change of heart and they welcomed Paul in his message of Jesus. That's letter, uh, answer A. Uh, they called Barnabas and Paul gods and gave them access to the local temple. C, they stoned Paul and left him for dead. Or D, did they bring a crippled man to Paul so he could be healed? Somebody want to take an attempt at answering that question? Let's see. I'm looking. Oh, who's over here? Is that you, Kate? Excellent. C, they stoned him and left him for dead. Excellent. That's exactly what happened. Okay, turn the page. Uh, so this is always fun to talk about in church. Uh, Acts 15, what was the main issue discussed and debated at the second Jerusalem Council. Let's see. Who haven't I seen a hand for? Kay. It was um, the discussion about circumcision. It was the discussion about circumcision. Excellent. Can we make sure that Miss Kay gets some candy? This next question comes to us from Acts 16, verse 10. And I've only given you that verse um, but do you remember what is literarily significant about it? And I'll read it to you while you think about it. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Anyone? Oh, I see a hand in the very, very back. Who's that? Sarah. Sarah. He had a vision of a man telling him to come, but when he showed up, it was Lydia, a female. There was no men to be found. Awesome. Save that for the next question, and I'm going to re-ask that question. <laughs> you are going to be so ready for the next question, Sarah. <laughs> Anybody else? Jeff's pointing to somebody, and I'm not seeing the hand. Peter. 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 Right here. Could it be that's the first time that the we and us appears with Luke? It is. It's the change of pronouns. So we think that this is where Luke joined the journey. He became part of that. Up until then, it was told in the third person, they went, they did. And now you see the transition to we concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, so Luke is now part of the story. Uh, Sarah Vandervoort, this next question is about mansplaining. <laughs> Could you please explain how Lydia can be both a man from Macedonia and a woman from Thyatira? I can try. <laughs> um, and she can't really, but okay. you, you, you know the answer. So Yeah. The man from Macedonia was in Philippi. They thought that that's where the vision should be. There was no Jewish men. It was Lydia. But she's originally from that other name, <laughs> the TH name. Yes. Um, but she had gone to Philippi to be a maker of cloth and make money. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So Paul thought, you know, he had this vision from a Macedonian man, and the first believer and person that he interacts with, lo and behold, is not a Macedonian man, but a woman from Thyatira. So surprise. Another multiple choice question. Are you ready? In Philippi, Paul was beaten and thrown into prison. B, was he arrested for fortune-telling and freeing a slave girl? Uh, C, did he draw his sword on the jailer? Or D, was he fishing in a local river where people gathered for worship and baptism? Anybody feel like they can take a stab at that question? Apparently, I'm really good at writing multiple-choice questions. <laughs> Will McCracken, what do you think, man? He was beaten and thrown in prison. Thanks for paying attention while doing your job, Will. That's beautiful. <laughs> now it's time for a commercial break. Adult Ed started today. Uh, Crystal Brazel led an amazing class on the importance of rest. Thank you for that. And also next week, uh, Peter Strong is teaching, and he's going to be focusing on Sabbath. And so hopefully you'll join us at 9 o'clock down in Fellowship Hall. 
Okay, here's a make your case. Got to use your thinking cap. Uh, was Paul an apostle to the Jews or an apostle to the Gentiles? And you get to make your case. I, I want to call on somebody besides Ron because I've called on him before, and I'm really trying. I'm just to start calling names, like people have been to seminary, and you know. Oh, okay, so we can return to Ron. Thanks, Ron. What do you think? What's your case? Was he an apostle to the Jews or to the Gentiles? I, uh, he's known as the apostle of the Gentiles, but I think he was really an apostle to both. Yeah. Do you guys agree? He's known as the apostle to the Gentiles, but he really, you know, if he went to the synagogue every time he, he showed up, yeah. Okay, you ready for a map? This is the Via Ignatia or Ignatia, and we talked about why this road that went from east to west, why it, how it played um, an important role in how the book of Acts unfolded. Anybody want to tell us why? I'll give you a hint. We looked at some slides that, you know, maybe you weren't expecting to see when I was preaching of Roman road building and all the different layers that they filled and all that kind of stuff. Anyone besides Bruce Fairbanks who so desperately wants to answer? Why was that, why was that way so important? This is not a complicated question. I see. Okay. I'm going to have to call on somebody again. <laughs> Kate, why don't you tell us? The fact that there was a road there made the trip actually possible? Yeah, that was, that was, that was a really hard question, that, <laughs> or the, a really easy question that I made difficult, right? He was able to travel on, and go to those towns because uh, the world had, had roads, and he was able to, to take a stab at that. Some of you, I know, know the answers to questions, and you can be participating. I hope you feel that anybody who did not get a question, they were treated with grace and kindness, and you can trust the same for yourself. Here's a multiple-choice question. In Thessalonica, Paul's preaching created a conflict. The jealous Jews accused Paul of, was it preaching on the Sabbath, having too many female disciples, <laughs> turning the world upside down, or circumcising non-Jewish men. Come on, somebody be brave. Somebody who hasn't answered. Ah, thank you, Kate. Tell us. Is it cheating if I'm looking? It, <laughs> <laughs> it is not cheating to look. I wouldn't have put the references there. <laughs> so C? It is C for turning the world upside down. Thank you. Here's a visual that we looked at before. Uh, what is the name and significance of this spot, and what city is it located in? And by the way, we're following the book of Acts chronologically, so if I have a reference in, in the former question, you might be like, oh, well, that might be a little bit after that. Where is this? Can you raise your hand so I can see? <laughs> Colby, where is it? What? It is in Athens, and do you know what that big rock is called? Would you like to phone a friend? Who could help him out? Al, uh, Silver, why don't you help Colby out? It is near the Acropolis. Who else could Colby phone? Oh, I see a hand in the back. It's what? Mike Jones, tell us. I would suggest Mars Hill. It's just Mars Hill, so give yourself a piece of candy and give Mr. Mike Jones for helping you out. Excellent. Okay, so here's one where you get to do some thinking. Uh, Paul uses, some would say, clever, uh, a clever literary approach related to the culture of Athens um, in Acts chapter 17. Do you think he was a successful and then make a case for your answer. So he's at Mars Hill, and he gives sort of a, a famous speech conversation. Doug, tell us what you think. Yeah. 
So he looked around and he says, I see that you have many idols and gods, and you, you're so religious, you even have one that says to an unknown God. And then he says, what has been formerly unknown to you, I will declare. Uh, did he convert a lot of people? Not necessarily. So maybe that wasn't his leading uh, approach. Don't know. Okay, somebody can tell us three things about Corinth. Three things about Corinth. Famous for architecture and columns. columns. Excellent. They had a famous brass works there. Excellent. Um, what's that? It was a port city. It was really close to that, that narrow place where people traveled exactly, where we have the, the Corinthian Canal nowadays. Thanks, Joe Lynn. Okay, you can give her candy. <laughs> I realize that the idea of getting additional people to raise their hands is failing miserably, so. Um, we have more questions than we have time for, and so now I'm going to... Pick the really, really good ones. Let's do some true false. Um, the next true false I get to will is going to be upon returning to Jerusalem, Paul is accused of taking Gentiles into the temple area and defiling it. That's Acts 21. Friends, you have a 50 50 <laughs> chance. Is this true or is it false? I see some hands in the way back. Is that Heather? True or false? It's true. It is. Uh, Trophimus from Ephesus came, and they thought that he went into the temple, and they got upset. The next true false is Paul was raised and grew up in Jerusalem. True false? Actually, it's true. Check out Acts 22, because remember he said, I grew up in this city. Uh, Gamaliel was my teacher. He was born in Tarsus, but he grew up in Jerusalem. So since you just learned that fact, you get a point for uh, a piece of candy for learning a fact. Um, okay, can we go to about seven, eight more slides down the road where it's titled synonyms? This is very important. What is a lesser known synonym for the word shipwreck? Ann Wagner. Oh, she's so close. Water accident. Okay, I see Jill Jensen in the back. What do we have? What's that? A sea accident. Excellent. I have said shipwreck so many times successfully in the last week. It's been awesome. And our last two questions are, uh, did you learn something during this sermon series that you'd like to share? At the end of the service, come up and tell me, and I'll make sure you get chocolate. And then the very last question is, some biblical commentators say that Acts 29 is still being written. What do you think they mean, and do you agree? Somebody want to take a stab at that? Gail. The Holy Spirit is still working in the world. The Holy Spirit is still working in the world. Excellent. Thank you so much. If you want the full set, I can uh, share it with you. To our young people, thank you so much for handing out candy. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much. Let's pray. I hope you had fun today. Yes? Lord God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the love that you share with us. Lord, we, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for his story and the places where we can find our place in that same story. We pray, God, that we would be as faithful in our lives as he was in his. I thank you for each person here today for their faith, whether they know a lot of facts or they're, they're still learning, thank you that we can come together and share and pray and be the body of Christ to one another. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Doug, if you'll come up and introduce us to the offering, and then Maria will sing our closing song. Our ancestors in faith gathered together long ago to remember, to be restored, to be renewed. They shared their story, prayed together, and made an offering to God as they prepared to set out on the long journey to freedom in the promised land. Today we gather to remember and to pray together, to be restored and renewed, and we bring our own offerings so the ministry of this church will continue to participate in the saving works of God. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
Friends, the other thing I didn't want to forget to remind you of is that is uh, the memorial service for Sue Reynolds celebrating her life is today at 2 p.m. at Seafarers Memorial, and we want to welcome her family for joining us for worship. I also want to acknowledge two people I've known for a really long time, Linda Serb and Steve King. I know from Walk to Emmaus Community. Uh, Steve just received his certification to receive a call in the United Church of Christ. Am I saying that right? So congratulations to you for all your study, and I hope you find a, a church place soon. <laughs> Go in peace and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And all God's people smiled and said amen. <laughs>